Elephants are the largest animals on four legs. They have few enemies, but even these huge creatures are wary when they approach a waterhole. The zebra and antelope are nervous too. They know that where they gather to drink, predators come to hunt. It's not only the larger creatures which are in danger. This is the story of the animals that depend on a waterhole in Utosha National Park, Namibia, and the dramas that affect their survival. This water hole is different from most in Africa. It's fed by a spring and never dries up. After the rains, it's full of water, yet surprisingly empty of animals. At this time of year, residents like the dabchick and red-billed teal have the place to themselves. After a few weeks under the hot sun, the rainwater puddles out in the bush gradually dry up and the animals start to trickle back. The return of the herds is bad news for a pair of blacksmith plovers, which have decided to nest at the water's edge. Plovers are courageous birds. They stand their ground against all comers, spreading their wings and calling loudly in defense of their nest. The rains have watered yellow flowering weeds that flourish where all the grass has been eaten around the waterhole. They're edible, although not particularly palatable. The tangle of weeds helps to conceal the plover's eggs from predatory birds, but cannot protect them from hundreds of trampling hooves. Three warthogs intent on a drink in a wallow add to the plover's problems.
The rains have triggered the hatching of millions of small brown flies. It's a feast for water birds, especially the waders. The green shank picks off the flies, one at a time. The fulvous tree duck and the cape teal scoop them by the beakful. The plague of flies has come at just the right time for the red-billed teal and her hungry ducklings. There always seems to be one chick in every brood that doesn't realize the danger of wandering off on its own. A lone duckling represents easy prey to a lanner falcon. Teal are born with a natural instinct to dive for cover. The reaction saved this duckling's life, but the danger isn't over. Amazingly, the whole family has survived, thanks partly to their mother's brave defense, but also to the brood's ability to duck dive. The blacksmith plovers are still having serious problems. There's only one treatment for nosy zebra. In the end, it isn't the zebra's hooves that prove the plover's undoing. Tawny eagles are predators, but they are also opportunists, and eggs are always welcome. The plover's spirited diving attacks eventually drive the eagle off but not before it has cracked all the eggs. The parents recover the cracked shells and pull out the embryos, but too late, they're dead. The springbok produce their young during the rains, when the grazing is good. Their lambs are one of a lion's favorite prey. They're not very filling, but they are easy to catch.
Lions have even been known to kill baby elephants, although usually only one which is sick, injured, or separated from the herd. For this reason, elephants will not tolerate lions when they bring their young to drink. They make their feelings clear. During and just after the rains, the elephants of Itasha disperse into the woodland to the northeast of the waterhole. Here they drink from pools and puddles for as long as they last. A month after the rains have stopped, when the country has dried out, they're suddenly back. There's nothing an elephant loves more than water. After the bath, a dust down. A layer of mud probably helps protect against biting insects and skin parasites. These yellow flowers grow on a low, scrubby species of acacia. The sweet, nectar-rich flowers are a favorite food of giraffe.
Their tongues manipulate the thorns to strip the flowers. A drinking giraffe is in an awkward position and vulnerable to attack by lions. To reduce the risks, giraffe try to drink in groups with at least one animal standing guard. The combined attractions of acacias and a drink draw giraffe to the waterhole. An occasional outburst of high spirits probably helps release nervous tension. As with a herd of horses, it all seems to be triggered by one skittish animal. Lions rarely kill giraffe. Those long muscular legs can kill a predatory cat with a single blow. This giraffe is an exception. It has a bad shoulder wound, which probably encouraged this lioness. The giraffe is an adult bull. Apart from the wound, it's otherwise healthy, and the lioness soon recognizes her mistake. The giraffe must be very thirsty to risk walking through the middle of the pride, even if they are more intent on sleeping than hunting. Dusk is not far away, and the giraffe wisely decides that in the half-light it would be dangerous to linger. At sunset, the prey animals leave the waterhole to seek the comparative safety of the open plains. As the moon comes up, the only animals left are those big enough to have few enemies. What happens at the waterhole in darkness often remains unseen, but when there's a full moon, it's sometimes just light enough to watch the dramas that unfold.
the black rhino come to drink after dark. They are solitary by nature and sometimes quarrel when they meet at the waterhole. The elephant herd ignores the rhino and takes pride of place at the water. Double-banded sand grouse probably come to drink at twilight to avoid predatory birds of prey, which are only active during the day. Rhinos are very protective of their calves and regard all other rhinos as a potential threat. When a young elephant finds itself in the middle of a pride of lions, it trumpets an alarm. The rest of the herd immediately rush to its aid. Once again, the lions must back down. For now, there is peace at the waterhole. But at sunup, the predators will be on the hunt again. The zebra aren't under attack, for now. But all around them, other animals are fighting life and death battles. The blacksmith plovers obviously regard the black-headed heron as an enemy, though they are not its prey. The heron's specialty is doves. Instead of fish, it stalks small birds. Having caught a Cape turtle dove, it dunks it possibly to drown it. The heron has its own problems. Tawny eagles steal a percentage of its catch. There are plenty more where that one came from.
This time, it's taking no chances. It flies off with its prey before the eagle can catch it. The doves coming to drink at the waterhole face attack from below as well. This one is lucky to escape. But the capture of the next victim has an almost prehistoric horror about it. Finding themselves too far from the water to feel safe, scuttle back to try again. The dove is badly injured and is unlikely to survive long. Like most cats, lions are naturally curious. The terrapins have trapped an egret by the leg. At least one terrapin has got a firm grip on the egret's foot. The lions are cautious. By the time a cub goes to investigate, the egret is free, but it has paid a price. The bird is lucky, its injuries are minor, and it has a good chance of making a full recovery. Few predators get the better of a terrapin, but the fish eagle's curved talons and hooked beak can find the chinks in the armor. It's one reason these reptiles rarely venture far from the safety of the water. Unlike the terrapin, the tortoise lives practically all its life on land, although it can swim. Its shell is stronger than its aquatic relatives. Even so, an elephant could accidentally crush it underfoot.
If the waterhole produces moments of comedy, it also provides scenes of beauty. As the dry season progresses, at least 200 bird species come to the waterhole. The great white pelican comes to fish, but most, like the ostriches, come to drink. Unusually for birds, it's the females in this species which compete over a single male. A battler eagle brings its two young. Now fully fledged, the chicks will soon have to set up territories. Theirs, too, is a battle for dominance. The quarry bustard is no threat, but crows seem to regard all large birds as enemies. It's not a continuous drama. The majority of birds drink and bathe in peace. There are hosts of small birds, as well as giants like the four-foot-high Cory Bustard. Crowned guinea fowl often arrive in huge coveys. Red-billed quelia descend in swarms. Both species rely on safety in numbers to confuse their predators. September is the height of the dry season. The rains aren't due before late October. Now the animals are completely dependent on Itosha's permanent water holes.
large family of banded mongooses comes to drink. These Namakwa sand grouse are no cause for concern. Nor is a wallowing warthog, but a jackal is a serious threat. These guinea fowl have been waiting to get to the water for some time. They've been scared of crossing a large open space. The coveys have gradually built up until there are hundreds of birds waiting to cross. Finally, strength in numbers gives them courage. The jackal is a capable hunter, but is confused by so many potential victims. Underwater, another predator waits patiently to single out its prey. The python snorkels, its nostrils hidden among the waterweed. An Egyptian goose spots the danger. For a red-billed teal, it's already too late. The python can stay totally submerged for an hour or more, but eventually it must breathe. It uses its nine-foot-long body to coil round its prey and squeeze it to death. Finally, the snake releases the duck and swallows it whole. Flamingos aren't usually found feeding at small water holes. They're normally seen on large soda lakes or at the coast.
The majority of the birds are lesser flamingos, with some graters among them. This strutting march is a prelude to courtship. The flamingos normally live on algae, but under these drought conditions, they are forced to compete with avocets for crustacea. One reason why flamingos choose large, remote lakes on which to feed and breed is for safety from land predators. When the rains come, the flamingos will return to new pools on the Itasha pan. If the rains are late, they may have to move hundreds of miles to the salt pans along the coast. The height of the dry season is easier for hunters. Antelope, like these kudu, have to congregate at the waterhole. This time, the cheetah loses her quarry in the dust. She's got a large family to feed, so she'll stay around the waterhole until she is successful. She lets her cubs feed before taking her share.
It's October, and the rains are coming. The springboks see the approaching storms and start to move away from the permanent water. There's food and drink out where the rain is falling. The rhino won't need this spring-fed puddle much longer. The springbok pronk with exuberance, as if they instinctively know that they will soon find release from the confinement and ever-present danger of the waterhole. The permanent residents, teal and Egyptian geese, will stay on throughout the rains that last from October to March. And at the end of the wet season, the grass will grow and the plains will be green again. The water hole will still be there. It'll be a little fuller and a lot fresher. And there will hardly be an animal in sight. There will be carpets of yellow flowers, but nothing to eat them. It's hard to imagine that all the dramas of the past few months ever took place. But the sun will dry out the land again in a few short weeks, and the massing throng will be back. For all the waterhole's dangers, the animals of Itosha would perish if they stayed away from it for too long. <laughs> 